Uh, welcome to the channel. So today we'll be talking about the announced writers for the DC Lanterns project, which will be about two Green Lanterns, you know, dealing with the crises on Earth and the associated space, and which I think it's supposed to be a cop drama. But uh, DC Studios co-head James Gunn was sharing an update on Lanterns, the DCU series in development at Max. Uh, Gunn took to social media to confirm that the writing team behind the series will include Damian Lindelof, Chris Mundy, and Tom King. Uh, Gunn's tweet said, quote, Yes, it's true. The Lanterns DCU series is putting together a crack team of writers based on a wonderful pilot script and Bible by Chris Mundy, Tom King, and Damon Lindelof. A hearty welcome to Chris and Damon as they join the DC Studios family. No welcome necessary for the old Tom King, who has been here nearly since inception. Now, to get into the nitty gritty of, like, who's who. First off, let's talk about Damon Lindelof. Um, Lindelof is officially joining the DCU, but has been in talks of joining DC since, I want to say, when Gunn first announced his slate and his writing team. But Lindelof had to, I guess, finish up on some projects or was waiting until Gunn was going to officially give him a movie or TV show. But Lindelof, though, has received critical acclaim for a number of his projects, including 2019's Watchmen. The DC comic series at HBO that won a 2020 Emmy for Outstanding Limited Series plus acting awards for Regina King and Yahya Abdul Mantine II, which I hope I said that correctly. Now, personally, I haven't seen a lot of Lindelof's work or the ones I have. I, I can't really rave about. Now, his movie writing career dates back to 2009, where, where he was uncredited for helping tweak Star Trek for J.J. Abrams. This would... You know, then follow actual credited works on 2011's Cowboy and Aliens, 2012's Prometheus, 2013's Star Trek Into Darkness, and World War Z, followed by 2015's Tomorrowland and 2020's The Hunt. So, a real decent bag of excitement and, you know, just all around popcorn eating type movies. You know, nothing really deep. You're not going to come out with a philosophical thought. But just something to turn the brain off for a couple of hours while you watch explosions and lens flares. But his TV credits is where he's able to really flex his muscles, where he really picked up his acclaim. His first big TV series was Nash Bridges, where he worked on one season in uh, 2001, which I've never seen, where he wrote five episodes but was the story editor for the final six season before it was canceled. Uh, not his fault. It was mainly because of Don Johnson. He just wanted out. He was getting tired of working for Paramount. After the ending of Nash Bridges, Lindelof found work on another TV show within the year as a writer, executive story editor, and eventually co-producer of Crossing Jordan. He would work on the show for three years. Now, I can't say how much impact he had on the show, but during his tenure, it did keep a steady rating of between 7.7 .7 to 8.1 out of 10. Uh, of course, this rating is by fans, so, you know, it should be taken with a grain of salt. Now, Crossing Jordan would last for another three seasons before its cancellation, but during that time, Lindelof would go on to leave Crossing Jordan and co-create with J.J. Abrams and Jeffrey Leiber, who kind of got credit for it, but didn't really have much impact on it, which is his greatest creation, or at least his most acclaimed, Lost. Lindelof would write over 45 episodes and executive produce every single episode of Lost. During this time, he would go on to win countless awards, help jumpstart numerous careers, and make himself a prize writer. After his tenure on Lost came to a sad and commonly disliked final season, Lindelof would take time away from TV and focus on his film career, first serving as a writer on J.J. Abrams' Star Trek movies, before moving over to work on writing numerous other movies. But in 2014, Lindelof adapted Tom... Perota's The Leftovers for HBO into what has been considered one of the best TV shows ever. I personally can't say that. Uh, I just haven't seen it. So, But after pulling a opposite of Lost, where season one was alright, but ending on a great acclaim, Lindelof took some time off and worked on scripts here and there. Until 2019, when he returned to HBO with his Watchmen. Now, I can review movies as good and bad and deep dive into them, but that's an entirely different project. But Lindelof's movies, if I could give them a review, are just popcorn movies. But his TV shows, which 
I haven't seen most of them, are what we're talking about because of his work on the upcoming Lantern. As of right now, Lindelof's work on The Watchmen is his only superhero project. And in my opinion, it, it's a mixed bag. Many people will tell you that the show is great, and others will tell you that it's nothing more than, you know, race-baiting garbage, as the show did delve into racial issues. For me, certain episodes worked, and they were great. I remember, as I haven't really seen the show since it came out, enjoying the flashback episodes and the episodes that lack Dr. Manhattan. But people have had issues with the Seventh Calvary, which is in the show, uh, which is a white supremacist group that wore a Rorschach mask, uh, while terrorizing people. Now, personally, I didn't have a problem with them as they had commandeered something to fit their narrative, warping Rorschach's views to fit their own. It, it, it happens all the time. People all throughout history have done that. I had more issues with just the overall story. It was fine until they began talking a little bit more about their world with police slash heroes wearing masks to hide their identity. Redford is a six-term president. Racism is at an all-time high because of the Redford reparations. And, of course, Dr. Manhattan's hiding inside of Yaga Adul Mantis II, or was him. I, I don't really remember it that well. And, and that's kind of where I just stopped watching once they did the big reveal. So I only think I watched like eight or seven of the episodes, which I think was ten in total. But I, I remember distinctly not hating the show. But I do think it was made in poor faith. It was during the presidency of Donald Trump and it was at or about to be at the height of the BLM riots. So I just assumed it was a bad faith TV show. But that is the overall highs and the few lows of Lindelof. If this is leftover and lost Lindelof, we can see some truly thought provoking and human stories that will stick with us for years to come. While if it's Watchmen style, we can end up seeing some very aggravated fanboys on both political sides attacking one another for years. At worst though, we'll just get an awesome popcorn munching TV show filled with action and explosions which, you know, can be mid at best. Now, if you're still with me, thank you, let's talk about Chris Mundy, the other name that is now connected to Lanterns. Mundy isn't uber famous and you know, he doesn't have his own wiki page as Tom King and Lindelof do, but he has been in the industry just as long. More as a producer than a writer. He has wrote for countless shows though, just more in single digits like an episode here or there, and doesn't really hit the double digit mark until he writes 14 episodes when he becomes the producer of Criminal Minds, which he worked as an executive, co-executive, and consulting producer for over four seasons and 101 episodes. He was also a supervising producer for Cold Case for a season in 2005. Mundy then followed up those two shows with co-producing a season of Hell on Wheels and writing two episodes as well in 2012. Then he followed up Hell on Wheels with a TV show that he created and produced and wrote all 10 episodes before it was canceled by AMC called Low Winter Sun. He then kept with the trend of producing and writing with his next three TV shows Bloodlines, Ozarks, and True Detective. So he may seem or have a mixed bag, but it does seem that James Gunn does know who he hired to write Lanterns. He wanted Lanterns to be a dramatic cop show and with Lindelof covering the dramatic part, Mundy definitely brings in cop drama, but he has honed his skill with the success of Bloodlines, which ended in a mess, and Ozarks, and the newest season of True Detective. But now we finally move over to Tom King, and there's not much I can tell you, uh, mainly because I just haven't read the guy's work. He has a long history with comics, debuting his first comic in 2012, uh, which was called A Once Crowded Sky, he actually wrote this after the birth of his first child and leaving the CIA, so that's pretty interesting. But from there, he has worked with both DC and Marvel on numerous projects and has gained the praise and ire of fans all across. I don't really read modern comics as I didn't get started with comics until after leaving high school in 2012, so I still have a ton to read and catch up to. But I did read Tom King's Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, which I have spoken about before. I I just think it's an alright comic. I know that there's some people out there 
who have said it's their favorite comic ever. I could just never go that far. It's all right. It, it's basically a wordier version of John Wick. An alien shows up, shoots Supergirl's dog, and steals her ride. Supergirl then goes on a quest to find him, wiping out cells of evil on different planets on her journey. Then the book ends with her defeating the bad guy's pirate crew and locking the villain away in the Phantom Zone. And then, of course, you know, it shows years later after the Bowery King sidekick, because I can't remember her name, who narrated the story, who is finally old and gray, and Supergirl, who hasn't really aged at all, probably because of the distance between each other's worlds, arrives with a dog, which I assume is Crypto, um, who didn't die, and she brings the bad guy out of the Phantom Zone, and they kill him. So to me, the, the, the plot was stolen from John Wick, and to me it's just basically the exact same story with a little bit more oomph here and there, and that's it. But to share a little history of the show though, the Green Lantern series has been in development since 2019 with Arrow producer Greg Berlanti behind the project. It was originally supposed to be a continuation of the Arrowverse with David Ramsey continuing his role as John Diggle, but sadly this scene plays out like so many other post credit scenes by DC. But from there the show took many different shifts leaving John Diggle and David Ramsey behind as the show shifted toward HBO. Then in October of 2022 it was reported that the show had shifted once again. The series after moving to HBO would center on Guy Gardner and Alan Scott with Finn Whitrock and Jeremy Irving in the roles respectively. And the last I heard about that, it was supposed to be an anthology series about Alan Scott as the first Lantern in the 40s, who's also, I want to say, homosexual. So it'd be about a superhero living in the 40s, about different crime-solving episodes. And then it would jump to modern day where it followed Guy Gardner. However, the show then refocused towards where Jon Stewart, one of the first DC black superheroes, and one of the longest-serving Green Lanterns, and one of the first Green Lanterns that... I guess you could say I got to meet or was introduced to with TV shows like Justice League in the early 2000s. And it would also follow Guy Gardner, who Nathan Fillion was cast as. As of right now, we still don't have word on who will play Jon Stewart, but I assume Lindelof may look at actors that he has worked with in the past. But outside of all that, you guys have a good one, and I hope to God that I finish this video before they announce Jon Stewart. But, bye.